Hello and welcome to the Plural Positivity World Conference 2019. This session is titled The Soto Identity Disorder 101 and Healing with the Three C's. If you don't know me, my name is Sarah N. Clark. I am from the Netherlands. Our body is 31 years old and we live here together with our two cats who you might hear me out in the background from time to time and our amazing 10 year old son. So we are in no way a licensed or non-licensed therapist. We are a DID expert by experience. We live with DID every day. We got diagnosed in 2011, 12 and 13 as we wanted to be extra sure and dealt with a lot of denial back in the day. After we got diagnosed, we noticed there was no therapy available. And by now we know that is a worldwide problem, not just a problem here in the Netherlands. So we needed to take the reins into our own hands and hence we read everything we would get our hands on related to DID and early childhood trauma. We also went to a couple of conferences. We went in 2014 to a conference about early childhood trauma here in the Netherlands. We went to the Infinite Mind Healing Together conference in Orlando, Florida, which I highly recommend. And just last week we went to a conference here in the Netherlands on early childhood trauma and dissociation with Olmo van der Hart, Katie Steele, and Suzette Bone, which was an amazing experience and I feel extremely privileged I was able to be there. And now that I'm able to convey this information that I learned there to you on this platform. So in 2017, after we read all those books, we started a YouTube channel on, on DID. Um, there weren't that many back then. And so over by now we have over 100 videos, um, all DID related on our channel. And we are extremely pr proud of the work we have done and the information that we have already spread. And so we hope that we can convey a lot of that information in all those separate videos together into this one big file for this, for this conference. We are super excited that we were able and allowed to participate in organizing this conference. And we are very much looking forward to share this information today with you. So what are we going to learn? We are going to talk about DID and OSDD, obviously. We're going to talk about the DSM and the ICD. We're going to talk about the theory of structural dissociation, about alters and their roles and functions. And I'm going to share all the things I wish I had known when I was just diagnosed with DID. And much more, because there is a whole lot of information in this video. So get yourself a drink, get comfortable, and let's do this. So I wanted to like give a little bit of a background thing when we decided to do this session, we first wanted to do plural 101, but because the Midnight System is already doing an amazing session on system terminology this afternoon, we've decided it would be better if we just focus on DID 101 as we know most about that topic. So I'm going to start in 1994. If you want to know more about DID before that era, I highly suggest you listen to the keynote session from this conference by Emma Sunshaw by Dr. E from Systems Speak. They did an amazing session earlier um, where they covered even more ground from before 1994. But I'm going to start in 1994 when the DSM-4 came out and multiple personality disorder became dissociative identity disorder. So by now, that is 25 years ago that changed from MPD to DID. But we still say MPD or we say I have DID, but it used to be called MPD in hopes of people understanding what we're talking about. I don't think it works. I don't think people understand better what we're talking about. I think they get a stigmatized idea in their head. That is just my personal opinion. Um, but we still use the old terminology and we don't see that with many other disorders that after 25 years, we still call it by the old outdated name. Then in 2013, the DSM-5 was released. And in the DSM-5, there were some changes to the diagnosis of DID. For example, it now says that we are allowed to self-report our alters. That means that a therapist doesn't have to meet one of the alters before they can diagnose you with DID. I think this is a very good thing because it can be very hard for, for a therapist to notice a switch. As the DSM-5 says that 90% of DID clients are covert and hence you don't really notice them switching. They notice it, but you might not notice it on the outside. And so I think it's very good that they added this, this criteria to the DSM that we can self-report our alters. There also was a change 
from DDNOS dissociative disorder, not other specific specified to OSDD 1A and 1B and OSDD stands for other specified dissociative disorder where 1A means you have amnesia but you don't have parts and 1B means you don't have amnesia but you do have parts. What is also good to notice here is that the ISSTD guidelines, the last revision, was released in 2011 and the DSM-5 came out in 2013. Obviously some of the information was available uh, before it was you know officially released but still we think that the, the guidelines currently are outdated and use certain terms that are just unclear like dissociation can have at least four different meanings integration can have many different meanings and so it can get very confusing i think also for therapists to really understand what it is saying especially if english is not their first language because unfortunately the guidelines are only translated to french it seems so at the end of 2018 the icd-11 was released it won't be implemented until 2022 so that is important to know up front but it was released and we can read the information that they have released. So I will put it on the screen for you and you can read along. So what I noticed here, what is standing out to me is that it says typically episodes of amnesia that can be severe. Typically doesn't mean always, which could mean that if you don't have amnesia, you can still be diagnosed with DID. There is also a big change coming to OSDD once again in the ICD-11. It is not very clear to me what they mean besides what they write right i can give my own interpretation to it but it's still unclear what they exactly mean or or base this description on but they're changing osdd or they're taking osdd out and they're creating a new disorder called partial dissociative identity disorder and i will put it on the screen so you can read what it includes I wish I could give more information on this as I, the last thing I want is to cause a panic for people with OSDD. I like the description of the partial dissociative identity disorder and I think it is very similar to median systems. And if you don't know what that is, I highly suggest watching the Midnight System session later today. But I don't want to include any further personal opinion as to avoid creating some sort of explanation that is un untrue or unclear. I didn't create this text, right? It's in the ICD-11 in this way and there's no further information available at this time. So I will just leave it with the text and I hope that that gives you enough information to understand um, what they are changing. And if you can, let us know in the comment section if you think this is a good change, if you agree with partial dissociative identity disorder or if you prefer the label of OSDD 1A and 1B, what do you think is the best? I'm curious to hear your answers to that question. It's also interesting to notice that the ICD-11 is using the word amnesia again because that is not in the criteria in the DSM-5. Most people don't realize that, but the word amnesia or time loss is actually not used in the criteria in the DSM-5. What it does says is, and I will put it on the screen so you can read along, reoccurring gaps and recall of everyday events and we have to pay attention to how that everyday is written that means not every day of someone's life of your life it means everyday events like did i brush my teeth or did we go to the grocery store today or was that yesterday or even last week things like that it also says that having amnesia of your trauma is optional right Not everyone doesn't remember their trauma, as we read in the DSM-5 criteria, and or traumatic events. And lastly, it says inconsistent with ordinary forgetting, and I really like that sentence. I think that makes a lot of sense. It's hard to define what is ordinary forgetting, but I do think that when you have the ID and you experience that amnesia, that it does stand out as not ordinary forgetting, especially to other people. Because for us, it is our normal, right? We live with it every day. People ask me, like, don't you get scared if you lose time? And obviously I do to a certain degree, but it's also always been like that. So I think it would be a lot more scary for someone 
one day waking up and not remembering um, what happened to them. Then for me, he was always lived with this fading in and out of life. But in the ICD-11, we are going back to the word amnesia. And so it's, I'm glad that they add the word typically and not always or, or, or something in that regards. So the DSM-5 really only has three criteria to diagnose DID with. So it's really not that hard. Um, the first one is that you have two or more distinct personality states. Um, so two or more alters. And there is some debate or questioning, I guess, for some people because they think there is the one person, the original or the core or the person with the, with the legal body name and age and, and birth, date of birth. Um, we're going to talk more about that later, but that is not how the DSM explains it. Two or more just means two or more. Uh, so if you have to look at it from a core perspective, then you have the core and one other alter or more. The second criteria is amnesia, as I'm just going to call it for short. And then the third category is distress. You have to be distressed by the disorder. And that can include denial, so not being able to accept or believe that you really do have the ID. And that can be in phases and waves. That's almost often how people experience it. It comes in waves. So sometimes you fully believe that you have the ID and it all makes sense. And then five minutes later, you're like, I can have the ID. Nothing happened to me. This is all uh, made up in my head or something like that. And so we go through waves of denial. That can be distress. Distress can also be in waking up in a place and you don't know how you got there or uh, alter spending your money on clothes, for example. The question is, if distress is no longer part of your disorder, do you still have the ID? And then is the question, what, what really counts as distress? I think that is a very individual question that only the client in the end can answer as a collective system if they are still distressed by the disorder. And we will talk more about that later as well. So we have two personalities or more, amnesia and distress. And then we have two criteria that you that it can be related to. So it can be cultural related or religious related, and it also can be induced by substance use, like drugs or alcohol, which makes sense. So especially if someone is self-aware and self-reports, it shouldn't be that hard to diagnose DID. Yet from research, we know it takes six to 12 years to get correctly diagnosed with DID. And before that time, before they finally get the diagnosis, people with DID have often already collected a whole bucket list. Well, no, not a bucket list, but a whole list of diagnoses before they finally get to DID. And sometimes the other diagnoses get taken away, other times they stay comorbid. Um, and some people have comorbid disorders with DID. But I think it's very important that once someone gets diagnosed with DID that the other diagnoses get reevaluated because it just shows from, from research that it takes six to 12 years before you get to that um, correct diagnosis of DID. And again, the DSM-5 is very clear that we have the right to self-report our parts. So these days, it really that really should help to improve the length of time before we get diagnosed with DID, but it isn't yet because therapists are not up to date yet with these changes. They are still, a lot of them are still thinking in the terms of MPD from before 1994, as they are still talking about core alters or core personalities um, and things like full fusion merge integration things that is no longer on the table um, as the main outcome for most DID patients or clients, as we like to say. So let's dive a little bit into that. So Putnam said that infants are born with different ego states and they switch very easily but rigidly through those states. So they have little control over which state is, is dominant in the front. He also explains that babies or infants around age one are starting to learn to achieve something called homeostasis. This is the ability to modulate states so that they are, the infants, in a context appropriate state and the capacity to recover from state. So to show these ego states, I found a clip from a baby, an infant, um, on the Daily Mail website, and I will include that video here. I've cut out the audio as I think it might um, trigger people you hear the mother laugh. 
um, I will also explain up front to you what this video entails so you know exactly what to expect. It is meant as a joke, not as an abusive situation, but we can certainly debate if it is abusive. Um, so the mother, uh, the baby is sitting in a chair and is laughing and the mother sprays with a spray bottle some water on the baby's head. And the baby starts to cry or look very angry. And the mother laughs and the baby starts laughing again. So you see the baby going from happy to sad or angry and happy again very quickly in a few seconds. And so I want to insert that clip right now. So if you don't want to see it, please look away. So in this clip, I think it very clearly it shows these ego states that Putnam is talking about. And this, this theory is also used in the theory of structural dissociation. What it explains is that we are not born with a set in stone personality. We are not born as the people we are right now. We gain experiences and cultural backgrounds and all sorts of things that made us up to the person we are today. And so what they explain is that those ego states, they, they reach homeostasis and they become eventually, they integrate basically into one personality that is the single singleton person that we know that lives without DID, right? The one person in one body kind of situation. What they discover though is that early childhood trauma disrupts that natural integration process and prevents our brains from integrating memories and situations into one cohesive situation. Basically, a traumatic memory stays stuck in the front of our brain literally in the front of our brain so it's literally on our minds all the time it's impossible it seems for for our brain when the trauma is not processed to go from the short-term memory to the long-term memory memory where it doesn't have the mu as much emotional effect on us as when it is still in front of our memory when it's not processed and so they explain that with the id it's not like we are split off um, as, as we often say, right, I split off or I have, we, we split off, but that's not how it works. We just never got the, uh, the opportunity to integrate due to early childhood trauma in the case of DID, that is. And so once these states don't integrate and stay separate over the years, if they are, um, especially if they, they front, they gain more knowledge of the world and hence they form into a part and they are not they are not a state but a part as they call them now in the literature what we call an altar um and so they get maybe their own name their own age their own memories especially that's the one thing we all have they carry sort of memories of either abuse or or trauma or very positive memories that is also very well possible so in the theory of structural dissociation, we talk about EP and ANP, and that stands for emotional part and apparently normal part. And the last term is very offensive to me, but that is what it's called. So we're going to use that term. So I will put an image on the screen so you can read along and maybe get a better visual understanding of what they're trying to explain with the theory of structural dissociation. So if primary structural dissociation, which includes things like PTSD and single time trauma, which then creates one A and P, one apparently normal part and one EP, one emotional part. Then we have secondary structural dissociation, which include things like OSDD and borderline personality disorder, in which there is the case of one A and P, one apparently normal part and multiple emotional parts. And then we have to tarry structural dissociation, which includes things like DID, where we have multiple apparently normal parts and multiple emotional parts. And I hope I correctly pronounced that word. I'm sorry if I didn't. So it's very interesting how they have categorized all these other disorders within structural dissociation as well. It's not just a theory about DID. It's about all sorts of disorders related to early childhood trauma. It is very important to know that the theory of structural dissociation is a theory. It is not a diagnosis. We have heard some people say they have structural dissociation. That is not a thing. Um, that It can be diagnosed like that, not 
uh, legally health insurance wise and it is not in the DSM or the ICD. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear that it's a theory and that it is not a diagnosis on itself. So let's talk a little bit about alters, the types of alters and their functions. As you might interact with them in your own system or with the parts in your clients that you're working with. So the first alters I wanna talk about are protectors. Protector alters are alters were created back in the day to protect us against the abuse, either by holding memories from us or blocking us from fronting while um, trauma or abuse was happening, or because they took the abuse. They were there when the abuse or the trauma took place. The second alter I wanna talk about quickly is a persecutor alter. A persecutor alter is an alter that is a misguided protector, as I like to call them. So these are alters that leash, lash out or that maybe self-harm or upset people inside. Maybe they abuse people inside in the inner world. Um, persecutors can do all sorts of things, but they do it as a way to lash out, I guess, because they are misunderstood, not heard or not helped. And I think if we do help them, if we do listen to them and if we provide them with better uh, coping skills and, and techniques, they can learn that they don't have to be um, that person anymore. They don't have to lash out like that. I say that person anymore because in our system, most of our persecutors were told to act out in a certain way or to do certain behaviors by an outside person. So that is why I say it like that. But I understand if that's not the case for you, that they are still the same person as they want to be. Um, they can just learn different coping skills if they're open for that. And if they're not open for that, they probably need some more healing first and some love and acceptance um, from both the inside and the outside world. I also wanna talk about introjects. Introjects are alters that are based on people on the outside world. So real people, this can either be a family member or a famous person, for example, um, or even a therapist. Introjects can both be positive or negative to call it that either. So it can be someone they have very good memories of or someone they have very bad memories of. Um, it can be both. I also want to explain the term fictive. A fictive is an alter based on someone on the outside world that is not real. So someone from a movie or a book, for example. I also want to talk about non-human alters. Non-human alters are is a, is a whole big category on its own, but it can include things like angels and demons. Um, maybe animal alters or anything not from this world. So I want to clarify something for therapists because it seems that there is some sort of myth going on in the clinical world that non-human alters are very rare. And I think what they forgot in their, <laughs> in their talk about this is that we, people with the ID, have no purpose, have no need to share in therapy about these alters unless there is a problem, right? So you as a therapist might not know that we have an animal alter, but we do have one. So we had a poll in alternation in our support group and over 80% of the people that participated said that they do have a non-human alter, but that doesn't mean that they talk about that alter in therapy. So when someone does, I think it's very good if you can validate them and tell them that they are not alone as they are not. It's not a rare thing in DID at all. And I think that is one of the big myths that we really have to work on within the clinical community that non-human alters are a very normal part of DID because you have to realize that we develop DID as children. Our child's brain and mind came up with that, not our adult brain and mind. And so from a child's mind and perspective, it makes a lot of sense to include a non-human alter in your system, subconsciously or consciously. I also think it's worth noticing in this part of the session that spiritual alters, for example, for example, demon alters are not necessarily bad. I think it's very, very dangerous to make an assumption about a certain alter because of their name, their appearance, or what they're saying, or uh, what kind of brand of person they are, non-person they are. Um, and I think it's very good to just 
talk to the part and and or to the altar and find out who they are from what they themselves tell about themselves because if you ask me about my persecutor altars i'm going to give you a very negative story probably but while you ask my persecutor alter themselves they will give you a much different story and probably something like i'm misunderstood no one gets me or i'm not being heard no one is taking me serious and i think it's very dangerous to put a judgment on a part because they say they are a demon for example or they say they are a protector or persecutor or an interject um, even if it's a negative interject um, like an abuser for example I think it's much more beneficial to explain to those alters that they can be whomever they choose to be day in day out just like every other human on this earth gets the chance to choose who they are gonna be that day um, and I think that once they learn they are safe in the here and now and they are not stuck in trauma time anymore that they can really heal and help the system. My persecutors are now my best protectors and they will stand up for me when I can't. We also of course have child altars. Most systems have child altars. Not every system has them or maybe they don't say they have them as to protect their own system as often um, the child altars are a lot more vulnerable. Um, sometimes they can become very clingy if they affect, if they experience affectionate behavior for the first time, even if it's in a completely, um, appropriate and professional context in therapy, they can still get very overly attached because they've never experienced that growing up as they only dealt with the trauma time growing up. Uh, we talk, um, our Ellert Nienhaus, I think. I think it's Eller Ninehouse talks about the day and the night child in the hunt itself. Um, and this is a sentence from a, a World War II survivor who explained about her having a day and a night child and they don't know from each other what is going on and that's how they survived the concentration camps. And so I think for many of us with DID, we also have a day and a night child and those night children now in the in now that we are not in trauma time i hope for you that you're not in, in in a trauma situation right now if you are i'm sorry um i'm speaking to hopefully most people in their adult lives got out of that traumatic situation right and are now in a safe place so if you are those alters might still be stuck in trauma time and the more time they get to spend outside and be in the here and now and experience safeness especially with um an adult supervision that's like for us brings a little bit more safety um that can really be a healing experience just by being in the here and now and experiencing safety safety so these were the alters that i wanted to explain in this session there will probably be more explanations today in the midnight systems session on system terminology so please tune in for that if you want to know more about the different types of alters i just wanted to give a brief overview in this session so in this video, I wanted to include a list of things I wish what I had known when I just got diagnosed with DID. So let's do that. The first thing I wrote down is nightmares. I wish I had realized and known that I would get nightmares, uh, that if I would dive into my trauma past and what caused my DID that I would get nightmares. I, I didn't realize that. And I wish I had known it was okay to talk about those heavy subjects with a therapist. I thought, and that my therapist would assume I would do the things I dreamt about or that they would think I have factitious disorder or something like that because of my dreams and my therapist later on made very clear to me that it's perfectly okay to talk about dreams and that a therapist will also um, see that that is an interpretation of something and probably not exactly the way something went or what you would actually do if you just dream about it and I didn't know that back then. The second thing I wrote down is that I wish I had known that more alters would show up later on. When we were diagnosed for about a year, we were very sad on we have a 12 alters and we closed the door and we later did it again when we were at 40 alters, we closed the door again and we said, this is the max number we aren't going up. This We know everyone in our system now. And that was not true. And I wish I'd known that and I wish looking back right now that I hadn't closed that door and that I would have been more welcoming to my other parts. I wish I had known that flashbacks can make little sense 
and that sometimes you can have two flashbacks at the same time and that they're intertwined and so hence it can't really be real what you're seeing but it was just at two different occasions mixed together into one big mess and it's just one big mess that you can't really make sense out of but then later on we found out that there were two flashbacks mixed into one. I wish, I wish I had known and realized that all the altars came to help us. They might not always use the best methods, but they always came and are still there to help us. No one is out to harm me, none of them. I know that might be different in some other systems as I know some systems deal with a lot of self-harm struggle, for example, and I don't want to diminish that. I do think that those altars would do self-harm, for example, that they are doing it with the best intent and that they don't have the knowledge or access to better coping skills. I wish I had known grounding techniques work like a muscle. So when I got in therapy, the only thing people said to me, the therapist said to me, was do grounding techniques. And I got so tired of the magical word of grounding techniques. What I didn't realize was that it was a muscle that I had to train or that I really literally had to reprogram my own brain to understand what I was doing while I was doing those grounding techniques. So they just made me dissociate more because I wasn't aware, I wasn't training my mind what to do. I wasn't training my brain and my neural pathways what to do when I was grounding. And so once I built that muscle, it finally started to work those grounding exercises. And I wish I had known upfront that it worked like a muscle or like learning to play a music instrument. We have to learn to play the instrument of grounding, which can be very challenging, especially in the beginning. And it's also not something that just you have to learn. It's like something everyone in your system has to learn. It can be quite a challenge. Another thing I wrote down is that I wish I had known the DID and plural community online was a safe place to engage in. I was so afraid to end up with altars or memories from other people that I would catch them like the flu. I don't think anymore that that is possible or not for me at least. I haven't experienced anything like that and I have my own DID group called Alternation which is also plural safe space for other plural systems who are looking for support. Um, I'm in there a lot and also in other DID groups and I've never catched someone's memory or altar or anything like that. And so I wish I had realized earlier that I can find a community and support in that place instead of being so fearful of it. I wish I had known how hard it was to find a good therapist that is willing to work with DID. I really feel like I was naive back in the day and I thought that I was just going to find someone magically. That still didn't happen. I still haven't found anyone who is willing and able to work with me in my area. I now see it as a privilege if someone has a DID therapist or a therapist able and willing to work with DID and also getting a diagnosis as it takes 6 to 12 years. I think it's a privilege if you have that option and since I meet people from all over the world I often see that it's just not an option for them to get a diagnosis, to get validated in that way or to get treatment for that or for their DID. I also wrote down that I wish I had known and understood that if certain puzzle pieces fell into place for me and things started to make sense for me that that didn't necessarily mean that my other alters also like understood it now or like that things were, fell in place for them as well. I didn't know that and I didn't realize that um, they weren't up to speed like I was. I wish I had known sooner that I could make my inner world safe. I really wish I had known that sooner and I promise you personally that if you make your inner world a better place, a safe place that your outside life will follow, it will also get better and safer. <sighs> okay, so this is a tricky one. I wish I had known that I wasn't a system. And what I mean by that is that when I just got diagnosed, I read the word system and I said, oh, we have the ID, so we are a system. I don't think it works like that anymore. I think you're only a system if you actively work together and we call that a collective system now. But I think it is good to know that a system is something that works together or should work together. And if that's not something you have achieved yet in your in your walk of this journey, that is no judgment to you, we all started there. 
um, but I think it's good to know and to realize that it is something you have to work on to achieve, to actually become a collective system. And that also includes keeping the doors open. The last thing I wrote down was that I wish I had known I didn't have to do it all alone. Even though I couldn't find help in the form of a therapist, I had a whole system backing me up, having my back. We switched hosts multiple times, so when I say I, we talk collectively for all of us. Um, I wish I had known that, that we could rely on each other, that we could delegate tasks in sight, that it was okay to accept that another part was just better at doing parenting or better at going to the grocery stores than I was. So I wish I had known sooner that it was okay to trust and rely on my system. So let's talk a little bit about what dissociation is. And I want to share up front that this information comes from Carolyn Spring, who is an amazing psychologist in the UK and she also has a YouTube channel and a blog or a website um, and I will put a link to that in the description below as well. Dissociation is a natural and normal occurring process in the brain. It is not something going wrong, it is something going right. It is a natural defense mechanism that activates when we are in in a, when we experience a threat, when we fear for our lives, that is when dissociation really kicks in and it is a natural coping mechanism. It's a natural good thing that the brain did. There's nothing wrong with dissociation. There's something wrong with the trauma we endured. So Carolyn Spring gives three examples of dissociation. The first one is an experience of feeling floaty and not being grounded. So everything may look like a haze or you might feel floaty or maybe even if you're very dissociated looking at yourself from outside of yourself. And that is called depersonalization or derealization. If you want to learn more about that, you can look those terms up. We also use the term dissociation to refer to the behavior of someone with the ID. And what we mean by that is that they are switching. So we might say, I feel dissociated and that might mean that another altar is trying to front or is already fronting and we are switching in and out. And the third explanation of dissociation that, see, that Carolyn Spring gives is not integrating or joining up information. For example, when you share your own trauma story but you have no emotions or not the correct emotions. For example, you have a smile on your face. I have that a lot when I talk about my trauma. My therapist asks me why I'm laughing and I'm not doing it on purpose. I don't even notice that my face is doing it. It just happens. And it happens because I am dissociated from the emotions of the traumatic event. So I might have the memory, but I have not integrated it, I have not processed it, um, and I don't have the emotional attachment to it. Those are three words, three explanations of the word dissociation. And so as you can see, that is very confusing. And the same thing is happening with integration. So if we look at the guidelines of the ISSTD, they explain themselves that integration is a very confusing term. And they also claim that, and that's true, but they claim that Kluft said that um, final fusion is the best outcome for someone with DID. And um, Olno von der Hart, who we met at the conference last week, he said the same thing, that people who are not, um, not going through the final fusion integration phase, that they are more vulnerable than those who do. I asked him if that was based on a study and he said no, it was based on his personal clinical observations, which, you know, is fair enough, but I think that's called his opinion versus my opinion. And I also think that in our groups, in our support groups, we see people who say I was integrated, but I am no longer. And I don't think that those people will go back to their therapist to let them know that unless they are very angry. <laughs> um, and so... You know, I, I don't think that his clinical observation um, is correct if you look at people who stepped out of that clinical world because they got so hurt because they, they were kind of probably forced to integrate into one person, especially a couple of years ago. That was really, you know, the thing to do. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> we shouldn't. Uh, it's not like that in the guidelines. It's not like that in the DSM. And what we need to integrate our, our traumatic experiences, our somatic experiences, and coming together as a collective system, right? Working on the three C's. So let's talk a little bit about the three C's. 
So I talk about the three C's, communication, cooperation, and co-consciousness. Co-consciousness means when there are more than two alters present at the same time, yet one is only in control of the body, because if more are in control of the body, things get messy. That is called co-fronting. Um, we talk about co-consciousness. So everyone can listen into what's happening on the outside world, can give their opinion on the inside world, maybe can pop out their head to give their opinion themselves. Some of them are very good at that. Um, and sometimes we refer to that as something called passive influence, which is a, an interesting thing and can be very difficult to deal with. I'm laughing, but it can be a very serious um, disabling thing in certain people's lives. So I'm sorry for the smile on my face that is in no way intentional intentional as I know how difficult this, this can be. There is a psychotherapist called Sue Richardson who published a paper, I guess, or maybe it was a talking session about the five C's and the two D's. And the five C's stand for compassion, communication, cooperation, connection, and co-consciousness. And the two D's stand for disconnection and dissociation. So I think that the three or the five C's are a perfectly acceptable uh, form of healing DID. I think once the distress is away, that you've already, for a big part, healed the DID. And I think, I dare to say, that I don't think the alters are the problem, the parts are the problem, but the CPTSD is the problem. And it's also the reason why certain alters lash out or make you know, not the best decision in certain times. I think it's because of the PTSD or the CPTSD that we also experience. And I think if you look from that perspective at those bad alters, that they're not that bad. They're just hurt, right? And they deserve love and healing instead of our judgment and our cruelness that we often express towards these alters as they express cruelness towards us. I think we have certain parts like that, or if you are a therapist and you encounter parts like that, that what we could do instead is listening to them and reserving time for them to just be. Maybe we can let them express some of their fears, their worries, or their traumas. And maybe we can learn them better new coping skills that they are not familiar with yet. Maybe we can teach them to rely more on the system and to ask for help inside when they need it. Maybe we can show them where to find others inside. As some of us, some of us parts are very separate and um, blocked off from the others in the inner world. It can be a very lonely place. So maybe we can teach them how to reach the others inside and to commute more with them as to feel less lonely. I think that the five C's by Sir Richardson are a perfect way to maintaining the three C's. So I think by adding compassion and connection, you will reach communication, cooperation, and co-consciousness long-term. I also want to talk a little bit about spontaneous integration, not to confuse with spontaneous combustion. <laughs> um, spontaneous integration is something that happens or can happen if you process trauma. It's where you don't plan on someone integrating, but it happens anyway. And it can be a very difficult thing to experience and to go through. We've had it happen twice now, and it can be very unsettling. But we do try to see it as healing in itself. We try to accept it as a natural process of healing. We all have the right to pursue happiness, whether we live in the USA or not. And so that includes healing for our trauma and healing for all the parts of us that experience that trauma and that carry that trauma. Obviously, for very large systems, it's not possible for them all to be heard individually in therapy. So that is why it's so helpful to be able to be conscious so everyone can listen in and give their opinion or state what they have to say um, while being conscious. It's very well possible to live a successful life with DID, whatever that means for you, right? I am not able to work a job for a boss and my government luckily doesn't force me to. Um, because of that, I am able 
to invest time into my Facebook groups, my website, and, um, you know, making conferences like this, for which I'm very grateful. When I just heard that I wasn't allowed to work anymore, I was really upset. That was not the reason I went into that office. I wanted help to be able to work. And instead, they said, well, you cannot work at all because if a little comes out in a workplace, we can be responsible for you. Which makes sense, but you know, it's also very difficult to accept. Right now, five years later, six years later, I feel very different and I feel very lucky and privileged that I am in a position where I'm able to share all this knowledge and information with other people online and that I'm able to run this support group and help people on a day-to-day -day basis. And I would have never been able to do that if I had worked a nine-to-five job. So even though I am on disability benefits and I don't have a normal quality of life story, I am doing amazing things in the world and I think others can too in the same or other areas of life, right? Before this, we worked with orphans all over the world. After that, we worked with elders right here in the Netherlands. We poured all our love into that. So you can live a successful life, whatever that means for you. So once that distress is no longer there, do you still have DID? And if not, and you're still plural, you still experience manyness, then what are you? Well, that's a very good question. And we still don't really have an answer for it. There is no clinical term for it. Um, so we have, as a community, uh, came up with the word plural, which is an umbrella term that includes everyone in the dissociative spectrum and everyone who experiences manyness, no matter the reason why or how. And um, so some people have healed, right? Or they have healed at least to that part where they are no longer distressed by the disorder. And so now they consider themselves either a healed multiple or a plural as an umbrella term. So lastly, I want to include how many people actually have DID worldwide. And I will show you a couple of slides that we created and the calculations were done by Liberty of the Sorority. So thank you for that. So we're going to go from small to big and the smallest country that I took for these pictures was the Netherlands, where I'm from. The world prevalence of dissociative identity disorder is 1 to 3% of the world population. The Netherlands population currently is 17 million people and 1% of that is 170,000 people. 3% is 512,000 people with DID in the Netherlands alone. So if we go to the next image, what we see in this slide is a graph of studies done for the prevalence of DID and we see results from 0.4% up to 6% uh, with psychiatric outpatient um, people. So this is quite remarkable to look at, I would say, pause the video and have a look at the statistics. Maybe your own country is in there. I'm not going to name them all one by one. Um, and there will be a written version of this in the description or there will be a link to it if it's too long uh, for those who are visually impaired. So the next country that we take is very big, especially if you compare it to the Netherlands, what we will in a second, but it has uh, not that many people in the population. So the population of Australia is 24.9 million people and 1% of that is 249,000 people and 3% is 749,000 DID systems in Australia. So I found this picture of an overlay where we see Australia on top of Europe and right here in the red circle is the tiny country of the Netherlands and we always have a similar amount of DID systems while our country is so much bigger. So that is how you can see that not many people live in Australia and that's why their number is pretty low but if we go up if we go to the next slide you will see that the, the prevalence of DID in the USA is 3.2 million when we look at the 1% and 9.8 million when we look at 3% of DID systems in the USA. So, and if we look at the today population, we've already hit 10 million systems with 3% in the USA. 
If we look at Europe, we have 512.6 million people in the EU population. That is 1% uh, is 5.1 million people and 3% is 15.3 million DID systems in Europe, which is a whole lot. If we go to Africa, we have 1.26 billion people living in Africa in the African population. 1% of that is 12.6 million people and 3% is 37.8 million DID systems in Africa. So if we go to Asia, which has 4.4 billion people living there, that means at 1%, they have 44.6 million DID systems, and at 3%, they have 133 million DID systems in Asia. The world prevalence of DID is 1-3%. to The world population is 7.6 billion. At 1%, that means that we have 76 million DID systems in the world and at 3% we have 229 million DID systems in the world. We hope this was educational to you. We hope you're not too shocked by how many DID systems there are actually out there in the world. As you can see, DID is not rare. DID diagnoses correctly which doesn't take 6 to 12 years, is rare. Thank you so much for watching. It was an honor to do this session for you all and to work together with the team of Plural Events. I'm super proud of everyone that we made this possible and that this conference is actually here. Thank you so much for tuning in and we hope you're there for the next session. Bye-bye.